Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's dark reading webinar titled Finding the Right Role for Identity and Access Management in Your Enterprise. It is sponsored by Radiant Logic and broadcast by Informa. My name is Becky Bracken. I'm an editor with Dark Reading. I will be your moderator for today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll ask you to provide feedback via the survey widget, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback is valuable in helping us improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or you can simply type your issue into the Q&A area, and we can offer you one-on-one -on -one assistance. With that, let's get on to our presentation finding the right role for identity and access management in your enterprise. Discussing today's topic is Jonathan Kerr, advisor at Lionfish Tech Advisors, and Wade Ellery, field CTO at Radiant Logic. If you wanna learn more about our speakers, you can find their bios in the speaker bio widget on your screen. And again, if you wanna ask our speakers any questions throughout the event, just type that into the Q&A area and we will get to those at the end. With that, I would like to hand things over to Jonathan Kerr. Jonathan? Thank you, Becky. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here again. And today we're going to talk about um, something which is near to both uh, my heart and also to my friend and colleague Wade's heart, uh, which is finding the right role for identity and access management in your enterprise. And I think the real question is, um, we're all talking about zero trust and indeed thinking about zero trust. Where does IAM fit into that? Um, so what do we mean when we talk about zero trust? What are we trying to achieve? And you know, why is IAM important in this, um, uh, in this um, uh, e exercise? So a couple of things I wanted to go over with. I'd like to talk about how IAM fits into our zero trust journey. I'd like to talk about a few good practices for IAM implementation, which I've picked up over the years. And then I'm going to slide it towards Wade uh, to cover, um, again, some of his best practice knowledge, uh, but also um, some of the interesting things that we're seeing in developing um, behavioral analysis and starting to use some of the machine learning tools to help us. So without further ado, um, how does IAM fit into a genuine zero trust? Well, as you say, for those of you who want to skip ahead to the end, it fits in at the core. Um, but let's look at the fundamentals. If we have a zero trust network, then conceptually or theoretically, we have no perimeter. We do not rely on the perimeter as a security control. Therefore, we need to know who's on the network, what's on the network, and indeed, what they are doing. It is essential, which means that a strong identity and access management policy is fundamental to successfully deploying zero trust architecture, which I think you know many of you um, will already say, yes, we know that. That's fairly obvious. And indeed, Wade and I covered that in a previous webinar. So... What does zero trust mean? Well, zero trust means that we do not trust that an identity assertion made in the past is still valid. So we will continually verify authorized users. And the second thing is we will grant each user the lowest possible privilege when accessing sensitive resources. What are sensitive resources? Everything is a sensitive resource. So for every access request, and we say user, but it, whether they are an IT administrator, whether they are an engineer, whether they are a third party of some kind, we give them the lowest possible privilege that they need to do their job. And 
again, you know, delve back into my analyst background and produce one of these uh, lovely glowing diagrams. Zero Trust and IAM complement each other. Um, using a strong IAM uh, policy and indeed implementation eases compliance. And again, something I've got an interest in, it reduces insider risk because clearly we are going to make it hard for somebody to substitute their ID or indeed um, to, you know, forge somebody else's ID. And so as I say, IAM establishes explicit trust. It makes a strong, trustworthy, excuse me, provable identity assertion. Zero trust removes the explicit trust. So it's normally the case of, well, everybody has access to the internet homepage. No, everybody needs to be authenticated to get access to the internet homepage and so on. But nevertheless, out in the world, we're seeing that zero trust is more a conceptual idea than an adopted practice. So it's still, yes, we want to get to the zero trust journey. And so I guess the question is, well, what's stopping us? Um, and there's a couple of things here which come into larger problems. Company managers, those holding budget, do not understand the importance of zero trust. And of course, what does this mean for us? Well, it means we're hitting that problem, which has historically been a problem in cybersecurity, of how do we talk to the board? How do we talk to senior management? How do we couch our understanding of risk management, risk tolerance, risk acceptance, in terms that these company managers understand? Because, of course, remember, risk to somebody who is highly entrepreneurial, who's focused in business development, risk is a good thing. And I've had senior executives say to me in my career, don't forget, risk is how we make our money. So we need to, again, understand how we communicate to the senior people in you know, other disciplines. And, of course, then you've got the concerns over removing permissions. Um, you know, you have, well... If somebody can't um, get access to the job, are we going to see a um, you know, highly emotive user who is in a um, position of stress because they feel they can't do their job anymore? And of course, these things do happen as we are engineering it. But again, they should be minimized with a good zero trust policy. And of course, we still see the implicit reliance on legacy security models. And for example, the perimeter trust model that, as I said, we kind of should be getting away from now. But again, we still see perimeter trust and we still say, well, can we have a, um, you know, can we have sort of zones of trust in different areas? And of course we can, but that does not obviate the need for strong identity and access management. So, with all those problems to admire, let's look at some best practices for IAM implementation. And again, I'm sure this is something that all of you have heard before, but the principle is everything we do in cybersecurity should have a zero trust mindset. We never trust. We always identify, verify. We assume breach and we apply least privileged access. And what does that mean? We say we never trust. Well, that means we don't trust that because a verification has been formed in the past or on another system that we should trust that. And of course, then people say, well, what about things like single sign-on? But don't forget, single sign-on is a fairly complex and subtle beast that doesn't just rely on a single assertion. It, single sign-on systems now have continuous verification which leads us into that second point, always verify. When we have an identity assertion presented to us that has any privilege associated with it, and of course, every identity assertion has some privilege associated with it, otherwise, why bother to identify yourself? Um, and again, we're also saying there are no free privileges. No one gets stuff by default. So we're always verifying. The third point is contentious always assume a breach. And people say, oh, you're teaching people some learned helplessness, or you're teaching people 
and that they you know they they can't secure a system and that's not true what we're saying here is that we will do our best to secure systems we'll put in the best protective controls we know we'll identify people as strongly as we know how and of course that's what we're talking today and we will then watch those systems to see if anybody has managed to overcome our protective controls and subvert our identification systems. And then we will have a practiced, rehearsed incident response plan so that we can contain and eradicate the threat. And that's kind of important, assuming that there is somebody who is smart enough, resource enough, has enough time, is lucky enough to get round the defences. Is quite an important um, piece in our uh, in our thinking. It's something which you know I've been preaching for many years. But of course, the second piece, if you assume breach, and that takes on to last point, then we need to limit the damage. So no account should just say, "Well, hey, you're inside. We don't want the what I call the wasp in the beehive approach anymore." This idea that, and for those of you, I'm a bit of a fan of bees, as some of you may know. Um, when a wasp tries to approach a beehive from the outside, the bees get very defensive. They'll basically surround the wasp. They will hug it to death. They will stomp on it. It will be, you know, the threat will be contained and eradicated. I think the model works quite well. However, bees don't do zero trust because if a wasp manages to get inside the beehive, the bees will go, ah. Yes, somebody said it was okay for that wasp to be there, and they will ignore it and let it go about its business. We don't want to be like that. So we apply least privileged access and we assume breach. And we only, as they, we only allow any accounts, any identity, the minimum access it needs to do its job. So I call this CARES law, because you know, obviously if I wasn't a bit of a show off, I wouldn't be doing these webinars. Um, and my, my, my law, which I came up with uh, many years ago in my former job, if you are authenticating with passwords alone, especially if it's something on the internet, you're already breached and you just don't know it yet. Everybody hates that because, of course, we all use passwords from like Facebook, don't we? And none of us ever use passwords from things like Facebook to our work emails and so on. Who does this apply to? End users. And we all know this. We're all, you know, IT professionals, cybersecurity professionals. We, you know, we know people don't do password hygiene very well. Privileged users. Hey, guess what? It's us too. And the accounts we use for DBAs and system admin and domain admin. But it's also payroll administrators, invoice administrators, treasury administrators are all privileged accounts. And there are many more to think about in that time. Outsourced IT, we're seeing a lot, of course, outsourced IT has been with us now for decades. But again, we have to apply the same discipline, the same zero trust to identifying, authenticating, and managing outsourced IT users as we do to our internal users. The same goes for our partners. If we have partners that are accessing our systems, we need to make sure everyone has an individual account. That can be a pain. Sometimes we're the last person to find out when an engineer in a third-party service partner has left. And by the way, this is a forensic case I did, um, I guess, around um, you know 15 years ago now, um, where an engineer for a, a tech company had left and had taken with them the admin passwords, the design diagrams, the circuit diagrams, the list of customers. And of course, still had access to the tech company systems as a partner engineer. Is some weeks before they found out this person had been fired for taking passwords and circuit diagrams and everything else. Um, it also applies to our customers. And previously, we've kind of gone, well, customers, they're a separate beast. We don't really have any control over them. And so unless we're forced to, we're not going to worry about you know, strong customer authentication. Well, guess what? We now need to care about strong customer authentication. In Europe, the European Banking Association says so. We're actually now seeing PCI DSS in its latest and greatest incarnation say this is a really good idea. It's something you should start paying attention to. And of course, machine-to-machine -machine communications. We forget about this. 
but a lot of our identities are not people, they're things. So when we have machine-to-machine communication, things talking to things, think about microservices, think about automated transactions, think about gateways to payment service providers and e-wallets if you're in the financial space, and machine-to-machine becomes really important. And a username password pair is simply not enough. So, as I said, always, <laughs> this is probably the scariest photo I could find for this uh, presentation, so I apologize for that. Always very verify the user with strong authentication. Remember CARE's law, even if you only remember it, because how could I be so arrogant to call a law after myself? Yeah, passwords get fished. Passwords get sniffed. Passwords get stolen in other ways by malware or just bought off the dark web because there's an awful lot of breach credentials out there. I think it's something like about 3 billion right now. I know this because I mine up some of them. Yeah, and these credentials are being used for all sorts of things. There is a dark market out there, and without getting too um, crazy about the dark web and dark markets, that rents identities whole for use by attackers and bots to go and do nefarious stuff with. And sensitive transactions and processes, therefore, require additional controls. For example, if someone's doing a treasury transaction, should they be able to do this on their own? Should we require multi-user authorization? For that matter, and we all know about these phishing attacks, you know, we know it, the fake invoices, the email saying, hey, we've changed our bank account. If you could pay the new account, that'd be great. And people still get caught for this. Overworked and harassed account teams get slammed by this. So maybe these sensitive transactions and these higher risk processes, evidentially they are higher risk, require multi-user authentication. So I don't do something on my own. Wade has to count to sign with me. Wade makes sure I'm not having a bad day. Digital signatures. Again, if we need to prove the authenticity of an originator, we need to guarantee the integrity of a transaction message. Digital signatures come into play here. But again, when we're thinking about this, zero trust comes into play because I know at least one bank who said, hey, we've got an automated service that people just pipe a transaction into, it gets digitally signed and sent out. Well, that's great, as long as you trust everybody on the network not to just put in their own transactions and get them signed by the uh, the signing party. And of course, Zero Trust says, we can't do that. So, the other side of this, we talked a lot about users, but we're all using devices, so the endpoint matters. Devices cannot be trusted without validation. The devices are just like users. They are entities that need to be validated and controlled. Identity-centric controls must be extended to the endpoint, which means you have to validate and strongly validate who is using that endpoint. All devices used to access corporate resources have to be in, enrolled. There's no such thing as, hey, I've just brought my own laptop in. If you want, of course, you can bring it in. You can connect it to the network. We're well into the stage of people having bring your own devices. But it must be enrolled in order to access any corporate sensitive resources. Remember, all resources have some sensitivity. Um, so what do we need to care about with devices? Well. We need to make sure if we our policies on disk encryption, anti-malware, patches up to date are all validated. And for those of you in IT operations, the next sentence is going to make you tremble and or write in and tell me how bad I am. You need to track and enforce the status of all devices, which includes the servers in your server farm, whether the server farm is in the cloud or whether it is a, you know, legacy, and we are seeing, it's no longer legacy, we're seeing the rise of the on-premises server farmers coming back and people realizing perhaps that's economic, it makes economic sense. So we have to make sure our servers meet disk encryption. Our servers have up-to-date anti-malware and up-to-date patches. 
No longer can we say, hey, this server is so sensitive, we can't touch it anymore. Everything has to be kept up to date. We need to organize users by groups or roles so that any policy you put in place reflect business needs. All salespeople can access the CRM. All um, development engineers or content creators, perhaps they don't need to access the CRM. Or perhaps you put rate limits. They only need to access single accounts, but not great swathes of them. We need to automate the deprovisioning. Remember my little anecdote about the, th the third party partner engineer? When somebody is let go or leaves one of our partners, they need to deprovision. We need to have an automated process that orchestrates deprovisioning from our systems when our partners leave. For that matter, when customers decide they no longer want to be our customers, we should deprovision those accounts. And of course, the salespeople who may have wandered onto this call are now telling me that's complete heresy. Um, but this is what we need to do if we're thinking about zero trust. And as I say, least privilege. It's not just for IT, it's for everybody. Admin privileges, no matter what the administration is, whether it's technical or business, are a hot target for attackers. I know this, I've seen the breach reports. And any business role, and I must, must, must repeat this, any business role is a privileged role. The invoice administrator, the payroll super user, they are all privileged roles. And so we need to strictly manage them. Movement should be strictly managed. In fact, there's a good argument that if you do have technical IT admin or DBA roles, should those roles be restricted to a management plane only? Should that be where we, you know, we allow them access? We don't allow them access operationally. Or do you say, well, actually, no, we may need um, them to access for network diagnostics. But whatever it is, we follow the rule that access is only granted to resources that are absolutely necessary job function and again you could make the argument well the dba in theory shouldn't really care about the network that's the job of a network admin it's a separate role so maybe we're talking about well you know if you're doing network diagnostics you need a separate role granted to you for that purpose and again all of this is coupled with strong authentication so I wanted to leave you with this, and I'm going to then hand over to Wade, is this idea of adaptive learning solutions. Most IAM solutions I see now have this concept of identity resolution analytics, and eventually my uh, former Alliance colleagues may start even talking about it as well. But they're all now collecting and analyzing information about users, endpoints, application usage, servers, policies and activities. Well, why are they doing this? Because there's a technology now embedded in IAM as well as in SIMS, which says, let's look at unusual behaviors. Let's look at the engineer who is browsing through the customer database. That's unusual. Let's look at the salesperson who's browsing through the engineering design log. That's unusual. That's anomalous. When we see unusual locations and transaction types, and we assign a risk score at that point, we can then say the IAM system, when it sees activity that has a risk score outside our tolerance as an organization, then they can perform activities to bring back into tolerance, which can include limiting access to applications, which can include additional authentication, could even include multi-party authorization as well, for particularly sensitive transactions. So I want to leave you with those thoughts. I'll now hand over to I said, my friend and colleague, Wade, who has got some more really exciting thoughts. Thank you very much for listening. Jonathan, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm going to do my best now to, to uh, live up to the uh, level of uh, professional uh, insight that you've provided. 
and, and take a little bit more of a nuts and bolts approach to some of the challenges that you laid out and some of the, the solutions you also outlined and, and best practices or um, really what we're now starting to tell everyone, uh, and I think this is a great move in terms of the uh, identity space, we're admitting that this is all a journey. Uh, this is not one project, this is not one product. You really are on a journey towards a more secure, uh, more reliable, more effective, uh, more business enabled environment. And, and knowing that that's a journey, you're gonna take incremental steps forward to do that. You don't have to boil the ocean, solve all the problems day one but you do want to start actually implementing purposeful changes to the organization and a lot in alignment with what Jonathan talked about in terms of the challenges there of a zero trust environment of the idea that I can't innately just give access to someone, even based on some strong authentication, there are so many more parameters that come into play in that process of authorizing that user's access. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's going on today in authentication and authorization in complex organizations uh, and how that has actually increased uh, breach risk. Um, why passwords are not enough, sort of touch a little bit on that. There's a real buzz out there around passwordless authentication. If I just get rid of my password, I've solved all my problems, right? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that is not quite the uh, the nirvana or the simple solution we're looking at, and then some some technical insights into how you can implement some of the uh, the re solutions or at least practices to enable the functions that Jonathan was talking about around securing your environment and building out zero trust. But really, why do we care about this? Well, as as I think Jonathan pointed out earlier, risk keeps us in business, and it's a risky business. 84% um, of organizations out there have admitted to or aware of or going to discover they were breached last year. Uh, there was a recent ransomware uh, uh, notification, I think, of a large healthcare organization that uh, was now becoming almost background noise. We don't report it as headlines anymore. It's just common that companies are getting breached on a regular basis, and that's highly uh, expensive for an organization, but also think if you're a healthcare organization and your patient records get locked, you're actually affecting patient outcomes at that point. So this gets to be quite dangerous to allow to uh, propagate. And then there's just the sheer volume though. There's most organizations over half have more than 20 identities per user. So you're talking about not just securing one point, but 20 points or more within each user's profile, each system has to be an untrusted platform that has a minimum amount of privileges and a zero trust lock on the door and process around that. So this exponentially gets wider and wider as you get deeper into the organization. And basically most IT leaders are aware they have a problem, but they don't know how to address it. They really don't know how to approach this. It is in some ways so large that you, you don't have an easy way to consume that elephant in one bite and you don't know where to start eating the elephant. And that's part of the challenge is understanding that as a journey, you basically need to decide what you have already and then what you can incrementally do to go forward and slowly consume that elephant. You're not gonna swallow it but you do have to start eating away at it. Now, there's some essentials to security processes, to basically what we do to secure our environments, how we provide ourselves with that blanket of, of uh, comfort around ourselves in a, in a world where people on the outside are trying to access and, and potentially do damage to our environments. And the, the front door is basically authentication. That's what we've always relied on. For decades, it was your username and your password. If that was secure, then I trusted you because you were inside my building already, you were on my network, you were on a PC that I could own and, and verify every day, and you were accessing applications on my servers. So as long as you authenticated yourself, I was pretty secure that you weren't some bad operator in my system. My firewalls were designed to keep those out. But what we've evolved to is a world where we have to recognize that just having a big bolt, deadbolt on the front door and a fingerprint reader on the front door and a combination lock on the front door and multi-factors of authentication. If you've seen ever in a movie, the, the front door locks on a New York apartment where they have seven different locks on there to get make sure that nobody gets in. 
that's great. You want to be able to authenticate that user so you know who they are. But once they're in the front door, a lot of families say, hey, the house is yours. Go in any room you want, do whatever you want, take anything you need. But a lot of families are, are much more organized and much more restrictive. You've got different rooms with different restrictions. Nobody goes in mama's kitchen when mama's cooking. So you can't just wander in the kitchen, open the refrigerator and start grabbing food if dinner's being made. You're kicked out immediately. You don't have authorization to go in the kitchen. The bathroom is someplace you can go unless it's occupied. And if you are in there in the bathroom, there's probably a time limit on how long you're allowed to be in the bathroom. So you have different rooms with different restrictions. The teenagers' rooms, nobody goes into. So there's violations that only one identity can access those resources. So if you wanna think about zero trust as a model where I have different rooms in the house that I've gotten into, I still have restrictions on where I can go and what I can do. And I also have to secure all the windows and I have to secure the back door. Because if I leave a door open, I leave a screen door on the back, no matter how many locks I have on the front door, I'm not safe, I'm not secure unless I have fortified my environment. And then how do you manage that? How do you know that the information and the data you're using to authorize people to access resources is accurate, is actually available and is, is on time and valid? So that that information, when it changes, when someone leaves the organization, as Jonathan mentioned, it can be days or weeks or months before people realize, wait a minute, John's still accessing the system he was gone a month ago to a new job. How come he's still in our platform? Well, that's something you should know right up front. You should be able to, to be able to see and to be able to administer. And that comes from being able to audit this data. You have to have observability. You have to have insight into what's happening and what's going on on the platform and manage that. The underlying challenge is that's not the way our systems were designed. And this isn't a design flaw that somebody did a bad job of, it's a artifact of the way the world evolved. We built monolithic systems to solve single problems, to give you one solution to one problem. I built this application to do patient record management. It does a great job of that. Does it interface with the radiology system? No. <laughs> Why would it interface with the radiology system? I don't even do radiology. I'm a patient record system. So this attempt to integrate systems together has created these silos of identity that require me to now weave together all the sources of information with all these applications. And in this simple illustration, this becomes very complex and very difficult to do. So I have a lot of challenges around just being able to look across my enterprise through a single pane of glass and see all the access and authorization and challenges that I have to my security model because I don't have a way of easily understanding the way everything fits together and operates. So there's some real challenges with that because that creates identity sprawl or, or IT debt where I have a lot of infrastructure in my environment that is unmanaged, that I don't have visibility to, that I can't trust is necessarily secure. And then I end up with inflexible and aging infrastructure where I have implementations on platforms as, as Jonathan mentioned, oh, that system's mission critical, you can't patch that server. Well, I have to be able to move forward in a model where I can address that built up uh, IT debt that I have in my infrastructure. And I need to close my security gaps. I need to be able to start doing processes across my organization that start enforcing uh, what I can do to secure my environment today. And that starts with looking at what you have already in hand. Do I have a single sign-on solution? Excellent. Let's see how many applications we can get into that single sign-on solution. Well, why is that important to security? Well, now I have a place to add my multi-factor authentication once that affects a much broader set of applications. I have one place to audit access logs to see who's accessing what, accessing what applications and what are they doing with them. I have one place to go to use my privileged accounts to be able to access high valued resources. So expanding the in, the investments you've already made are critical to, and then adding on higher levels of security to each of those platforms. Again, moving towards a model of a zero trust architecture. Now the challenge with zero trust is, again, it's not one product, 
it's not one project. Zero Trust lives in each part of your network environment. It spans everything from network access. Can I get on the network from home because I work remote now? Um, I had a, a, a challenge with one of our customers. They were hiring remote people to work with their organization that they never met face to face. They were shipping them out laptops that are going to give them access to corporate proprietary information. And how do they vet this person to know that the person they interviewed, the resume they saw, the person they hired was the person at the end of that connection and wasn't somebody doing some long con to get on the network without that face-to-face -face interaction that HR used to have in the office every every onboarding process, there's some real challenges to bringing this together. So you need to look at how this affects even simple things like network access, network segmentation is another area where zero trust, I can't travel the network unless I'm authorized to be on the financial subnet to access financial applications. And that may be a combination of not only my title, my role, my clearance, but it also may be my training level. I can't do SAP input unless I am current on my SAP training. So I add more filters to that access control and then all the way down to the application layer where admittedly things are the most immature. My applications are the least likely to be able to understand external authorization and policy-based access control today. We're moving down that road though, just like moving to the cloud, it took a number of years for us to get to SaaS based applications that actually did SAML and OIDC and claims based authorization. We're now moving towards an application infrastructure that externalizes authorization, lets a policy enforcement and policy decision point govern that environment and be able to secure that system. But again, the challenge I'm facing is I have all these systems here for ICAM, identity administration, my zero trust application controls, my gateways, my policy engines, and they're all trying to communicate with different sources of information that lives in different protocols and structures and schemas, and it makes it very difficult to build this system. And if I have to switch something out or add something new, or heaven forbid that I actually merge with another organization and I double this complexity of infrastructure and I try to replumb everything again, it becomes a daunting task that paralyzes a lot of organizations. You don't have the time and the budget and the sponsorship to maintain this long of a system. And believe me, the guy who plumbed this application to these back ends and got it working, if he leaves the organization, nobody has any idea how he did that and no one will touch it because if they break it, they own it and they have no idea how to fix it. So you really can't build your infrastructure on this house of straws. You need to add a layer of abstraction, a layer of aggregation. You need to deal with the desperate nature of all this identity data. That's not just your on-premise legacy AD data and some database information. I've got information coming out of the cloud. I'm pulling profiles down from ServiceNow. I've got HR data coming from Workday and PeopleSoft. I've got information coming out of Azure and Okta. My SailPoint platform has quality information that my, plan, my PAM platform wants to be able to use. My SIM system and my SKIM gateway are giving me access to tremendous amounts of information. All this is a different flavor, is a different part of the infrastructure and a different protocol in a different format that isn't easily consumable by all the applications that need this information to provide a zero trust infrastructure, to be able to give a least privileged access and authorize the user based on information that they have on that user at the time of access request. By using Radiant Logic to build this identity data fabric, to consume this data, to correlate it, to aggregate it, to build it into a common profile, to filter it and deliver it to each of the consuming applications in exactly the way they need that data, I make this information available and actionable so I can do zero trust, because zero trust lives on the depth and the quality of the information I'm using to make decisions. If I have little information or I can't trust it, my zero trust environment is going to be high risk and low value. If I have a lot of granular information, I can trust that it's accurate. I'm going to be able to implement policies that are going to protect my environment. 
So it's not just enough, though, to aggregate this data. Putting it into one big directory or one big database doesn't give you the, the access to that data and the ability to use that data effectively. You need to be able to build what we call an entitlement catalog or an entitlement data model. You need to be able to correlate this information together, but transform it and translate it so that each consuming application sees exactly what they need in the format, the structure, and the schema that they're expecting it. The applications are not built to decipher all this complexity. They want to have a simple world to go to. So you need to be able to transform that data into something meaningful and actionable for those applications. So we use a framework to do that for you. You have all your sources of identity data on the left. We're going to connect to that data. We're going to federate that. Now, federated is a loaded term. When you're talking about single sign-on, it's federating access to applications. I go one place and get access to many applications. We're federating identity data. Now, I'll say identity data in a broad context. It's not just people. It's machines, as Jonathan mentioned. It's applications. It's bots. It's anything out there that's an object that has attributes and relationships that wants to access a resource. Those are identities. And when I federate those identities, I bring all the disparate types of identities from all the sources in my environment together, and I correlate and abstract and manage and make that data available so that that data is actionable and I can start to observe that information. I understand the quality of my data. I understand where information is lacking. I understand how much I can trust this information to be an authorization model. And then I analyze this information against controls. Is my user properly vetted? Is he properly authenticated? Is he changed his password within a reasonable amount of time? Is he someone accessing something that should be accessing in that system? Am I able to actually now prescribe remediation when I find a user with an over uh, over provision set of privileges, or I find someone um, who is doing something out of the anomalous nature that they normally operate in, or I have groups that have not been accessed in six months, can I get those off the network? Or I have gaps in my data, can I, can I probably predict who a missing manager is for a user by correlating other attributes for common peers in that user's environment and saying these people are all in the same department as this missing user, uh, user with a missing manager, maybe they share the same manager and start to predict how to manage and clean up my environment, how to uh, forecast uh, remediation and actually start to manage the identity data information in a way that makes it high quality, highly available. But then take that data and not just make it an IT resource, Get it out to the business unit managers. Make this something they can actually see and evaluate. The marketing manager wants to know who onboarded in the marketing department this month, who got offboarded, who got moved, what projects are people working on, what are people doing in my organization, where do I have a high-risk individual that's, that's been flagged, and why is that person in my department, and why are they doing risky things? This is the person closest to the business. They know more than anybody what is reasonable. IT can see a broad picture, but not necessarily the context. The managers have that, so you want that in their hands. The auditors and the compliance people, these are the people that have to make the reports. They have to audit the environment. They have to be able to verify that the findings have been remediated. You want this information in their hands. So we're creating a policy information pipeline. We're taking all the attributes and driving it all the way down to the policy engines that are doing authentication, authorization, role-based access, attribute-based access, all the security implementation of a zero trust architecture lives at the end of this pipeline and builds out this infrastructure. You need this layer of functionality on top of just the aggregation of identity information because you need to be able to deliver that. Now, if you look at an external reference here to say, well, that sounds great, Wade, but it seems like you're making this all up in a vacuum, NIST, the National Institute of Statistics and something else uh, for the federal government in the United States has a NCCOE, a, a cybersecurity uh, specialty or excellence uh, team that is building out a zero trust architecture working infrastructure to map out for 
uh, organizations, both within the federal space, but all in the commercial space, what is a mature and an extended zero trust architecture looks like. There's about 30 major vendors in there. Every major logo that you would put on a NASCAR, uh, if you were advertising IT infrastructure, Cisco, Microsoft, IBM, Radiant Logic, SailPoint, they're all part of this project. If you look at the infrastructure, at the heart of this model is Radiant Logic. There are different solutions for access management. There's different solutions for SaaS and application management. There's different solutions for governance, but at the heart, the core repeated process or platform for Enterprise One and Two is Radiant Logic. Because we are built to take all this disparate information, and as I just showed you in that pipeline, bring this data forward in a way that makes it actionable within the zero trust environment and makes it something that's the core source of information to enable all the functions in that model. So again, if you look at a zero trust infrastructure, I'm looking at different multiple sources of identity data that need to go to a policy engine. This looks really easy. I just draw a green line in my PowerPoint slide, Bob's your uncle, it's done. It's not that easy. You have to have this identity data fabric because there is a tremendous amount of correlation, design, automation for group access. If you're gonna do our dynamic group-based access control, syncing data, managing this information so that my policy engines and Gartner estimates there's 28 different policy engines in a mature zero trust implementation today. And that's again from the network edge all the way back down to the uh, applications, data management, access to SQL data and databases. All this is managed by policy engines now. All these need the identity data in a specific way. And this policy information point is what Radiant Logic fulfills. If you look at most of the uh, models, you'll see a policy information point. This is the gateway, yes or no, you can get on the network. Yes or no, you can access that role in that application. Yes or no, you can access that data from that database and here's what you're entitled to see. The policy decision point evaluates the policy. If you're in Chicago, you work for Dieter Schuler, you're on large account, you can access certain Salesforce data. That policy is authored by someone that understands the business model and can write a policy in usually now in very much an English sentence type of format like I just outlined. But all that is reliant on the information in this model that feeds these decisions. It feeds the authoring. I have to author on the same data that I'm evaluating to authorize access. And I have to make sure that the user meets that policy requirement across all the attributes that are being evaluated before I say, yes, go forward with that. So in a zero trust model, and again, with Radiant Logic in place, I have disparate data that I bring together. I'm gonna to normalize that data because data is complex and has many different formats and, and figures. You don't wanna build a policy for all variations of the data. You wanna normalize the data at our layer so you're building a minimum amount of policy variations within that strata author those policies, and then have the profile for the user that's evaluated by the policy decision point line up with the author data. This data has to be the same, otherwise you write a policy that no one can ever achieve. And that same normalization is applied here. So even though my title may be different in three different systems, I'm gonna be evaluated on if I'm a VP of sales, I do get this particular access under this particular policy. So you're able to build this system out. Now, going back for a second to the front door, the idea of being able to use passwords to access this environment is a critical component, but we're working in what's now considered a passwordless model, or we're working more towards the idea of two-factor authentication. I think Microsoft claimed that somewhere in upwards of 90% of the breaches of AD or Azure would be mitigated if people just turned on two-factor authentication. It's now being required in a lot of scenarios that I run into now. You can't operate in some applications and platforms unless you're two-factor enabled. But there's a lot of legacy infrastructure out there, LDAP directories, databases, old applications that did LDAP authentication that don't understand how to operate in a two-factor model. This is another scenario where Radiant Logic can help. We can be this gateway between the application authenticating using LDAP protocols, 
which is usually a username and password that may be an AD, it may be stored in, a, in an LDAP directory or a database, it may be an Azure AD password that I they use to authenticate to the back ends. If you want to add a two factor, we simply append at the end of the password on the login page the token that is being used, the RSA soft token, the YubiKey, whatever that two factor model you've integrated in, the ping one token, you append that on to the password from the login page without altering the applications, Radiant Logic gets that signal, splits that credential in half, validates the old time password on the back end system that's appropriate, validates the extended uh, second factor and brings back a bind if the user is authenticated. So I have enabled now two factor authentication without doing any application modification in a system of legacy platforms that today I can't secure as easily in my organization. So this is another way to bring all this together and be able to actually accelerate your move towards zero trust. I can add that front door lock that's critical and then I can build out this infrastructure of recognizing that I need to have rich sets of identity information pulled together so I know whether or not I am actually, when I come in the front door, am I mama? Well, mama can go in the kitchen and she can make her spaghetti sauce because she owns the kitchen and that's, that's her area. I'm the teenager who can go into my own room because I own my room. Dad can't come in because he's not authorized. So by knowing who you are and then knowing enough about what you can do within that home, within that application, within that organization, I can secure that environment on a much more granular level without tearing down and rebuilding the infrastructure. I just need to incrementally add more security to my system, streamline my operations, and ideally, as we mature, we get to a scenario where this is frictionless and invisible to the user. He is continuously authorized throughout his day, throughout his transactions, but it's done in the back end with a very rich and robust set of identity data. It's done on the front end with a very smooth set of authorization engines. So I can do this in a way the user never knows it's happening, but I'm achieving that level of authorization security that gives me the zero trust that I need to be able to implement the system. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up my piece and turn it back over and open it up for questions. Um, and go forward Thank from there. Thank you with so any much. We um, certainly had an opportunity to learn quite a bit. Thank you, Wade and Jonathan. Before we get into the Q&A portion, I want to direct everybody's attention to the webinar survey. If you could fill that out before leaving us today, we would really appreciate it. Okay, let's get to some Q's and some A's. Uh, let's see. Let's, you know, I am interested in this. Um, do you, and let's start with Jonathan on this, do you see a big push for consolidation in the IAM market? And what impact would said consolidation have? Can you take that? Well, I think I think we are seeing it, certainly. Um, uh, Toma Bravo have recently acquired um, both uh, uh, Ping Identity and Forge Rock, um, who I guess I'd see as uh, pretty much head-on competitors. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see what the new organization look like. Will they continue to compete, both being owned by the same company? Will there be some alliance? And I'm not going to speculate because I think right now um, the DOJ is um, you know, scratching their heads over this one on what's going to happen there. Um, but yes, that indicates to me that consolidation is, is happening, will continue. Um, clearly, Ping have uh, previously acquired a number of organizations. They acquired Singular Key. Uh, they've been on an acquisition trail for some time. Um, so, yeah, there are, yeah, there is a, a growing uh, a growing appetite for consolidation fueled by uh, investment or PE uh, in this space. Wade, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I very much agree with that. That is the trend, and, it, and it's been a cycle. We We sort of see this. Uh, this model play out. I've been at this now for decades. I won't say how many, um, but uh, there is a uh, an innovation in the industry is often done by small startups, people with great ideas, people who break off and try and do something different. 
Um, I, I remarked at the Identiverse conference uh, a couple of, about a month ago or so that half of the uh, the 10 by 10 booths at the show expo were passwordless authentication companies of some kind. And I would bet a year from now, um, half of that cohort will either have been acquired or have been or disappeared. They're all making a bet on um, a different scenario and they'll be swept up by larger organizations. I do have to confess though that Radiant Logic is also uh, consolidating. We have we have purchased a, an organization called Brainwave. Brainwave is a, a governance compliance observability platform that we're integrating into Radiant Logic. So there is a growth or an intent on enhancing the functionality of these platforms. Um, but I think there's still a fair amount of diversity in the marketplace. I don't see us getting back to a monolithic scenario necessarily like an Oracle, like the Oracle or IBM days where one company had the whole gamut. Um, because I think there's enough historical concern that you still need some best of breed pieces in your pot to get the best solution you have. You, you can build a combination of aggregated with augmented best of breed. Understood. Let's I must pivot admit a little to a bit. soft spot for Brainwave, actually. They were my, uh, um, when I, the very first conference I attended as a Gartner analyst, when I stumbled out onto the vendor floor, they were very kind and sort of, uh, yes, uh, uh, very, had a very good conversation with them. Um, and a good, a really good example of innovation in Europe as well, because they're a French, originally a French company. Yep. Okay. Great. I'd like to pivot a little bit, if I may. Um, you know, a, a lingering issue for most security teams is that ongoing communication with the C-suite, you know, translating data into risk and into analysis that can be consumed. Can you talk to me a little bit, and let's start with Jonathan on this one, um, how uh, IAM tools can help that conversation and, and sort of how that integrates into the communication flow up to the upper management? Well, I think I think one of the things we have to do is to um, change the way we think about many aspects of IAM, but in particular authentication. We've kind of got used to the idea that it's a binary thing. Either someone is authenticated, and again, I'll use a simple example: they've given us the right password, or they haven't. In actual fact, we need to move to a phase where we have, uh, if you like, shades of authentication, reflecting the risk we see. So for example, when we're using multiple factors, we'll say, well, hey, okay, Jonathan Kaye gave us the right um, code from his phone challenge. Um, he's logging on from a location we recognize. Um, he's logging on from, you know, at a time we'd expect, you know, that Jonathan Kaye to be logging on, but, he's not using the machine he would normally use. So remember I was saying about devices are important. Mm -hmm. So the device he's using is not the one we'd expect or it doesn't meet policy. So that would, we're gonna get away from this idea of, hey, someone's authenticated or they're not. And we're gonna get into the idea of multiple risk factors and recognition factors. And again, obviously, the more of those we have, the more we're going to be looking at advanced analytics to tie those together. And then, as you say, the IM system can then inform applications or other resources and say, you know, this is the, you know, this is the, the trust we have established this user, and therefore you should or should not um, give them access to those resources. Wade, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, risk for us, again, being looking again at the practical layer is um, what we see now across a lot of applications out there are different ways to measure risk. Um, our brainwave integration has risk scoring based on controls that you implement and is this user provisioned and, and accessing a certain level of risk in terms of resources? Are they an admin on a certain platform? Do they operate in a certain parameter that makes them a riskier than the average bear? We see things like Proofpoint doing behavioral risk analysis over a much longer curve to say, is Wade doing generally risky things over the last six months? Is he getting more access than he used to have? Is he more risky than he was a month ago? And then we see things like AppGate measuring risk at the at the doorway, like Jonathan said, is he on the device he's normally on? Is he is his device, device properly vetted 
and is it properly virus scanned at the moment or is he not and it's a more risky scenario. The value of Radian brings is that all these components that can recognize risk in a particular context, we can aggregate those scores together. We can bring those different points of information to Radiant. You can expose all of them to your access layer that's making authorization decisions, or we can build a weighted aggregated score. Each component adds to that score, and I can then add up an aggregated risk across long-term profile growth endpoint access and in general uh, operational risk. And then that can be the score that my system makes decisions on, or I can give different risk scores to different policy engines based on what they need to consume. So it's key that we understand risk, that we measure it as many ways as we can, because it exists in different flavors, and then aggregate that together, uh, weight it, deliver it to the appropriate endpoint so that I can make as much use of that risk data as I can because it really is an insight into our security model. All right, well, sadly, we have hit the top of the hour, so we will have to leave it there for now. Um, any questions that were not answered will be submitted to our panelists today, and they can respond to your questions offline. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, Radiant Logic, as well as everyone in our audience. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email and details to a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues who might not have been available to listen to the event live. This webinar is copyright 2023 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Dark Reading and Radiant Logic, and the individual speaker, speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. With that, on behalf of our guest, Radiant Logic, I'm Becky Bracken. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you at a future Dark Reading event. Okay, we're clear. Great job. Great, great job, everyone.